Hey, welcome to Amplify, man, where we're turning up the heat every Thursday night with practical teaching for everyday living. I'm Pastor Michael Pilmore. Welcome to His Grace Church, where we're a destination for divine visitation, touching lives and changing hearts, man. So Amplify, man, we're going to be looking into the Word of God this evening and... Um, well, let's just get started. Hallelujah. I'm just excited. And so let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before you right now. We thank you for your word. We thank you that the entrance of your word gives and brings life and light. Tonight, Holy Spirit, I ask you to help me, to assist me, to guide me, and to speak through me uh, that which needs to be seen, that what needs to be heard, so that there's growth in the body, development in our own personal lives. And so we thank you for that now, in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so within this study, uh, back to the basics on health and healing, we've been looking at over the last several weeks, you know, what does God's word have to say about our responsibilities? What is, what is God's responsibilities? You know, he's in partnership with us. And because he's in partnership with us, then we have the availability then to walk in the guidelines and the precepts and the principles that he's laid out. And so, as we have seen in our previous studies, we have a, ne a nemesis, <laughs> a nemesis, his name is Satan. And he advocates against the will, the plan, and the purpose of God in your life. But what God says you can have you can have. And the word tells us in Numbers that God's a God that cannot lie. Did he not say it and will he not do it? And so th today we're going to look at how important it is that we judge ourselves. How important it is that we judge ourselves. Last week we looked at how important it was for our love walk, to, to have our love walk in, uh, in, in uh, a, a proper way. And so tonight we're going to look at how important it is then to, to judge ourselves. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, we're going to read through verse 31 in the New Living Translation. It says, that is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why, now notice this particular next verse, that is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. So if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. So what are we told to do in this passage of Scripture? We are told to examine ourselves or to judge ourselves, right? To judge or to examine ourselves. But... What does that mean? Judge us. Examine ourselves. What does that really mean? Well, if, if we define the word examine as to, to inspect or to inspect someone or something in detail to determine their nature or condition, to investigate thoroughly and to test the condition of. That's what, the, that's what, the, uh, that's what examine is by definition, is to inspect someone or something in detail, to determine th their nature or condition and to investigate thoroughly and to test the condition of that. So, what are we examining? What are we inspecting? Well, we're inspecting ourselves. And we're doing it in detail to determine the state of our condition or the state or condition of our life. But more basically, um, more, it's, but more importantly, it's important that we, more importantly, it's important. More, more, more importantly, we're examining or inspecting our love walk. That's what we're doing. We're inspecting our love walk. We're, we're also looking into detail of our life, the details of our life to confirm that we're walking then in accordance with God's word, his principles, and his precepts for our lives. And so when we look into the word judge, 
it carries the connotation, again, where it allows us to form an opinion about something after considering all the facts. So first we're to examine, we're to inspect, we're to look into detail and determine the nature of the condition basically of our love walk. We're to investigate thoroughly and to test the condition of where that walk basically is. And then we are to, to judge. We are to uh, form an opinion then about our love walk after considering all the facts. This tells us that we have to take a true hard look of exactly the details and conditions of our life. And in order for us to get to this point that we can judge our, ourselves, it's vitally important that we are honest with ourselves within the examination process. Too often, it's too easy to, to um, adhere to an unfactual condition because it's our belief. We believe something that is not true. And so if we're going to believe a lie, it will lead us into a falsehood of the actual facts. And when we determine within that, that what is based on truth is truth, then we can then detail and bring a detailed examination of that truth and we can review the condition of our life and where we're at. Are we in the place where we need to be? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Is our love walk actually um, doing what it's supposed to do? Or are there areas uh, for, uh, that would facilitate improvement? And so when we look at this word examination, we could use another word which we've already previously stated, examination could equal investigation. And I like that word a little bit better. As we examine things, we investigate things. And we are to investigate ourselves by carrying out research. That means we are to study into ourselves, right? So as to discover the facts or information that then would allow us to form an opinion about ourselves after we consider all the facts. And sometimes, again, as I've stated, the facts are always going to speak to the truth, but we may disagree with the facts because we're seeing it through a, uh, a different uh, viewpoint ourselves. And we're all perfect, right? We never make mistakes. And that would be incorrect. But why are we doing this examination? Why are we doing this investigation? Why are we forming an opinion and judging ourselves? So we have something to measure ourselves against the Word of God. If we are to line ourselves up with the Word of God, then that's, that is the measuring stick, and we have to make sure that we, that we come into line with the precepts and laws that God has set before us. And one of His precepts or one of His laws is He commands us to walk in love. Yeah. I got I to gotta sneeze, but it won't sneeze. <laughs> and so, again, the word judge carries the reference that it allows us to form an opinion about ourselves after we've done the investigation, after we consider all the facts. And for this reason, then, the investigation process has to be real. It can't be based on false facts. It has to be built on the real facts, not the desired facts. We all have the truth, then we have the desired outcome. Sometimes our desired outcome is fantasy. It's not reliving in reality of the actuality of where we're really at at that moment in time. It's where we think we're at, but we're not quite there yet. So if we're going to be truthful and honest when we make this as assessment, that's the only way that it can work. And nobody likes to see, nobody likes to see when 
we have failures or we haven't risen to the mark or maybe we haven't quite stepped up to the place where we need to be and so we need to make adjustments nobody likes to see that in their own life because we all want to make the mark and we all want to believe that we've arrived many times <laughs> i know i do and so then the details of our investigation should provide evidence meaning that it should provide proof, actualities, specifics, data, statistics that support the outcome of our examination or investigation process. And when we do this type of investigation into our lives, we are making inquiries then into our character, our activities, and or our background of our own self. You know, we're studying three people, me, myself, and I. And this is then a detailed synopsis of what is occurring or not occurring in life in line with God's laws and precepts. That's why it's important that we are honest with ourselves. Nobody's judging us per se, except God is asking us to form an opinion about ourselves after we consider all the facts. He's asking us to be honest, not so that he can put us down, but so that he can lift us up, so that he can help us, so that he can draw us closer, so that we can walk in that place where God has called us to walk in not only love, but free from sickness and disease Again, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 30, that is why many are weak and sick and some have died. Because they have not examined themselves and have not judged themselves. In accordance with the word of God. Now, as I was studying this, I realized there's many areas in my own life that I am falling short. And that correction needs to be uh, made. And sometimes it's easier to say things like, yes, I need to make these corrections than it is to do them and actually make the correction. James tells us that don't be just a hearer of the word, but be a doer as well. So don't hear about how God is love. Begin acting on his love. Begin walking in his love and be become a, a, an imitator of the God of God's love that's how people come to know Jesus is through the love of God God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord would be saved and so God's love is poured out in our hearts it says in Romans it's been shed abroad poured out into our hearts we have the capability and the availability to walk in love but we have to know what that love is we have to define that love and the parameters of that love are found in first corinthians chapter 12 um, or uh, chapter 13 i'm sorry uh, love the, the great love chapter so i i just encourage you to take a few moments and to review that particular passage of scripture and to and to see if your life actually is lining up with that passive scripture when we talk about love and i like to read it out of the amplified i like to read it out of the amplified and so um in fact i think that's exactly what we're going to do for just a moment let me get my bible out hallelujah it's important sometimes for us to to read the word of god instead of just quoting it And so, and I like it from the Amplified. And I want to begin reading at verse 4. I know we're not going to have it on the screen. I apologize for that. This is just kind of off the fly. It said, love, and we're talking about God's love in us. Love endures with patience. 
and serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful and not jealous or envious. Love does not brag and is not proud or arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not provoked, nor overly sensitive and easily angered. It does not take into account a wrong endured. It does not rejoice at injustice, but rejoices when the truth, when right and truth prevail. Love bears up, love bears all things regardless of what comes. Believes all things, looking for the best in each person. Hopes all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times. Endures all things without weakening. Love never fails. It never fades nor ends. So love never fades, never gives up. And that love that God has poured in us gives us the ability then to walk in love as well. But we have to define it. We have to know what it is. And then as we define it, know what it is, then we have to act on it. Love is not a natural thing when people are nasty to you, is it? I mean, instead of uh, bless your enemies, I want to whack them sometimes. But as we investigate into our own life then, is God's love, are we walking in love? Are we acting in love? this type of investigation into our lives, then it, it, we're able to see our character, our activities, and some of the things maybe that we're doing in the background. So when we take a cold, hard look through the investigative process of what is working, what is not working, what needs to be expanded, what needs to be changed, what needs to happen to bring more of a definitive role of God's laws and precepts in our life, we do this so that, that we can be published publicly or placed in view for God's glory. God wants to show off His love. His love is manifested through you. And so the process in today's vernacular we, we would consider it, how, how would we define this investigation? How would we define this judging of ourselves? I think um, the way that society may look at it today is through this word call, called self-reflection, self-care. And it's for the purpose of ensuring a better quality of life for us. So we're self-reflecting. And when we self-reflect, we're giving serious thought about our character, actions, and motives. That's what we're doing. We're giving serious thought about our character, actions, and motives. And quite, quite, it, it is important that we do have times of self-reflection, that we do take time for self-care. And simply put, when we self-reflect, what are we doing? We're taking time to think about, meditate on, evaluate and give serious thought to our behaviors, thoughts, attitudes, motivations, and desires. What's behind what we're doing? What's driving what we're doing? When we self-reflect, the psychological community tells us that we are, that, that there are basically two primary types of self-reflection. Two primary types of self-reflection. We have reflection in action, and then we have um, reflection on action. So reflection in action and reflection on action. And reflection in action takes place primarily when you're involved in a situation. And what it does, it, it, it involves using analysis of observation, listening, and or touch or feel to problem solve. So... This is going on primarily when you're involved in the situation and you're using your senses of observation, listening, touch, feel to problem solve at that very moment. This should then lead us ultimately to change uh, our viewpoint of self, our values and our beliefs. And because it's happening on the spot, this type of reflection often appears very intuitive. In fact, many times you don't even notice you're doing it. It's a trained response. Now, 
in many cases, it can take some time to develop the skills of reflection, of inaction, as the self-examination process is occurring during an immediate situation. So you can develop and grow these skill sets, and it becomes so intuitive that you don't even realize that you're doing it. Next, you have what, what would be called, you have reflection on action. And this is a little different than reflection in action is because this type of reflection involves stepping back from the situation, meaning that it happens at some time after the situation occurred. And because of that, it demands then a time commitment something you know time right time commitment something that often challenges is challenges uh, uh it challenges us in our life something that many of us don't have it's a time challenge and again despite this though it is important it is an important place in our personal development with god self-reflection can always help us to determine our next course of action the next time a situation presents itself. And I'll give you, I'll give you a, 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 a good analysis of that through a story here. Back in 2007, Pastor Kim and I had just moved into a new home. It was the first time that, now we had lived in the country for, for many years, man. And so, you know, locking the doors and things of that nature, eh, it, we, didn't, we didn't do a lot of that because we were in a very safe environment. We were on acreage. We were surrounded um, uh, with, number one, good neighbors, but there was property distance between us. And so here we are, 2007, we bought our, our first home back in San Antonio. Now, San Antonio is a little different than living in the country. Instead of living a distance from a neighbor and having freedoms that maybe we, we take for granted in the country, we are now living next door to somebody within shouting distance uh, when you open the windows, right? 60 feet, I think. Uh, it's not even 60 feet. It's, uh, not, it's 20, 25 feet distance in between the houses. And so sh sh uh, once we moved into this particular home, we felt it would be a good investment to invest in a security system, right? Because crime in the area was on the rise. And in this particular area, there was a lot of new home construction. And so there's a lot of transient personnel coming through the neighborhoods. And so we put in a security system. And shortly after moving into this particular home, while Pastor Kim and I were sleeping soundly in the middle of the night, the alarm suddenly tripped. Now, the actual siren for the, the alarm was right at our bedroom door. So it was very distinctive and very loud. And coming out of a dead sleep in the middle of the night to hear that sound, well, <laughs> it's, qu it's quite shocking. And, you know, two things are going to occur during this time. You're either going to be prepared for the event or unprepared. And what the situation showed us is that we were unprepared. We'd never encountered something like this before. And because th being, we were unprepared, our response then was incorrect and slow. And in this instance, it was just a door that had blown open in the middle of the night. It had jarred just enough in the wind to trip the alarm. However, after the event, Pastor Kim and I reflected and examined or investigated our actions because we realized we were ill-prepared should that had been a real-life scenario. And so what we determined is that what could we have done better? What we could have done better to elicit a more proper response in that situation? As we investigated our actions and reviewed uh, the scenario, we realized that there were steps that we needed to put in place to ensure that if that ever happened again, we would be prepared. You need to know that when you're waking out of a dead sleep to 
in an intruder situation, that is not a place where your brain is going to start immediately thinking and taking steps. That is where there has to be intuitive reaction. And so we talked about what we could do, and then we determined a better response should this event ha ever happen again. Now, this change could never have occurred if we had not been placed in this real life scenario. So we put a plan in place. Several months later, again, we were woken to the alarm being tripped. This time we were prepared. We had a plan in place to assess and walk through the situation. Now, the difference between the first time and the second time was this was a real threat. Someone was actually trying to come through the back door of the house. When the alarm went off, because where they were trying to come through, the alarm was right there, they determined it to be ill-advised. Now, to this day, Pastor Kim and I still use the plan that we put in place many years ago to ensure our safety when our home security alarm system is set off in the middle of the night. In fact, just a couple weeks ago, the alarm system went off um, in the middle of the night. And I was really asleep. And I, it took me a few moments to wake up. And when I woke up, she was already in her position. And then we were able to, to work together as a team to investigate the home to determine whether or not it was secure or not secure. So again, if we hadn't taken the time way back in 2007 to investigate the initial actions and determine that we had come up short, we were ill-prepared, we could never have made those adjustments. And so we could say it like this. What we did many moons ago, which was we examined our response to the situation, and when we examined, investigated, we judged it not to be up to par. We investigated ourselves by carrying out research Or we could say, we studied ourselves, we studied why the plan that we had in place did not work, and then discovered facts and information that allowed us to form an opinion about ourselves after considering all the facts. What were we doing? We, we were reflecting on our actions. This was reflection in action. And this is what we must do in these situations of life. If we examine, investigate, and judge our response to situations we are placed in, then it will give us an honest view of our response. And if necessary, it will help us to see what needs to change to prevent making the same mistake again. Within this particular situation, we knew exactly what needed to be changed so that we would never make that mistake again. And we haven't. However, if we are not honest in our investigative reviews, if Pastor Kim and I had lied to ourselves in that original assessment, we would not have a truthful analysis of what occurred, which would have then prevented us creating a path for change. So you have to have a truthful analysis to create a path for change. And when we self-reflect, who is the recipient of self-reflection? Everybody around us? No, it's us, right? If we go back to the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter, tw chapter 11, verse 31, if we would examine ourselves, if we would examine ourselves, did you notice nowhere in this particular passage of scripture reading that we are to examine or to judge our neighbor? 
We are to examine ourselves. We are not to investigate our neighbor by carrying out research or studying them to discover facts or information that then would allow us to form an opinion about them after we consider all these facts. That's not what the Bible's telling us to do. This is about us, and it is between us and the Lord. Now, as we saw last week, when it comes to discerning the Lord's body, we must be totally honest with ourselves and with God. That's truth. That is important. We have to be honest with ourselves. To be honest with yourself. So we have to be honest with ourselves, right? So if you were to be honest with yourself at this moment of time, are there any individuals in the body of Christ who maybe you hate, despise, you won't forgive, you're bitter toward or angry at, and you don't love? I mean, have you been critical of and murmured against those whom the Lord has called and appointed uh, to be spiritual leaders in the body of Christ over you? You know, many years ago, Pastor Kim and I were still young in the ministry and pastoring for the first time His Grace Church, and there arose a situation. Now, by the, by the Spirit of God, I knew a situation was occurring. But there was an individual that was going around within the church that was murmuring against us, that was speaking against us, that was speaking against the authority that we had. And they were, they were bringing uh, division to the body. They were trying to get people to see how their way was the right way. Many times... We do that, and with, with, with the rise of social media now, everybody is a critic of everybody in the ministry because their point of view is right and you're wrong. That's not judging yourself. That's not walking in love. You know, the Bible says there are many parts of the body, and every part of the body, Paul talks about in Corinthians, has its own unique place. The fingers do what the fingers do. The hands do what the hands do. And so I have learned that I may disagree with maybe what somebody is thinking or saying, but I will not publicly disagree with them because as David came up against Saul, what did he say? I had every right. I had the availability. I could have killed you at any time, but I will not touch the Lord's anointed. All of us are the Lord's anointed. And so you must take seriously then the Lord's command to love. You shouldn't speak against your brothers, your sisters. You shouldn't murmur against those whom the Lord has placed in your life to help you, to develop you, to grow with you. You know, one thing I know for a fact, it's not always easy to forgive, to let go of hurts, or to love those who've done you wrong. And there's a lot of people uh, that have, have risen against Pastor Kim and I over the years. Some intentionally, some intentionally. But just the same, words have power Words have, actions have also consequences. And so sometimes people unintentionally do things that create hurt in our lives, whether it's due to mis, um, misconception of their, their attitudes or their behaviors, or, their, or maybe it is intentional. Maybe what they're doing is just downright mean and nasty and they're doing it just to hurt you. Our response then is to forgive. Our response is to move on. And man, I, 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 I'll be honest with you, years ago I had somebody, I mean, there was someone that stabbed Pastor Kim and I. They didn't just take a little knife, they took a machete. And it hurt. And it hurt for a long time. And sometimes even today when I still think of that situation, it still hurts. So... I have to choose not to think of it and choose to continue walking in love towards those individuals. You know, 
First John chapter 5, verse 3, reading from the New Living Translation says, Loving God means keeping His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. So, we can understand that He would never ask us then to do something that He did not have the power or, or, or give us the power to do. Romans chapter 5, verse 5, And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. And I like this reading it from the King James. So I'm going to read it from the New King James tonight. Romans 5 verse 5 says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has, given to, who has been given to us, who has been poured out. Another translation, um, shed abroad in our hearts. That love has actually been poured out into our hearts. Notice the scripture in both translation that our hearts are filled with his love. Our hearts are filled with his love. Our innermost core being of, of who we are is filled with the love of God. It's been poured out into our hearts. Notice with me in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. For love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. We must choose to forgive others, and we must choose to walk in love. That, oh, pastor, that sounds so easy. Try it. See how your emotions react when someone who has risen against you. The defensive mechanism of the emotional aspect of our body, of our soul, you know, want to protect us. And so when people do these kind of things to us, automatically there's resentment, there's hurt. We want to build a wall. We want to push them away. But that's not what God does. He breaks down the walls to draw them in. And he draws them in through love. Love is not rude, unmannerly, unkind. <laughs> love doesn't push on its own ways. And in reality, holding grudges and, fall, and failing to walk in love are more harmful to you than to others. There's people that, know, that don't even know I was upset at them. There's people that don't even know I held a grudge against them. But it stopped my love walk. And so for my own sake... And in obedience to the Lord, I must forgive others and walk in love. I must examine and investigate myself. And if I'm honest with myself, I will find that there are more times that I come up short still than I overcome. But by examining myself and investigating my actions and my backgrounds and my activities, then I'm able to then put together a plan that will ensure that maybe the next time I won't cave to that same reaction. Some days I do real well. Some days I don't. So, but I've had to learn that in the areas that maybe I fail in, glory to God, His grace is sufficient. He loves me and He forgives me. And so I have to learn to pick myself back up, get back on my feet, and keep going. So let's look at several more scriptures that will free us to walk in love toward all of our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ tonight. See, there, there's many verses on walking in love and forgiveness, but for now, let's take a few moments and just discuss the heart or the, the spirit of man, the innermost being, the core of man. Our heart or our spirit is the central core of our being. Out of the central core of our being is where all the issues of life spring forth. It's where all these things begin. And the, because of that, the Bible tells us to guard our heart. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 says, Guard your heart above all else. Why? For it determines the course of your life. It determines the course of your life. 
And then in Proverbs, again, reading from the uh, 14th chapter to the 30th verse, is a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Notice that? A peaceful heart, a heart that's at peace, leads to a healthy body. Jealousy, then, is like cancer in the bones. So, what does this verse tell us about our heart? It tells us to guard our heart, to protect our heart, and to defend our heart. See, nothing can take the place of a sound heart. A heart that is free from all strife, bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, and grudges. Out of the heart, out of our inner core, central core of our being, flows the issues of life. And when we walk out of love with others, we clog up the flow of life. 1 John chapter 3, verses 18. I'm going to read through the 23rd verse. Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth so that we will be confident when we stand before God. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings and knows everything. Dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence. And we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things that please him. And this is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. And is a conjunction. It ties with, with what was said to what it is being said. So we must believe in the name of Jesus, his son, Jesus Jesus Christ, and then we must love one another just as he commanded us. Command is an order. It has to be followed. Something else that's important to note within this passage of Scripture is that love is actionable. It's just not pretty words on a page that somebody gives you on a card, makes you feel good. Love is actionable. Notice eight, verse 18 says, Let's not merely say that we love each other, let us show the truth by our actions. In other words, by our movements and activities, we will show the love of God to other people. And because of that, then our actions, our movements, our activities will show that we belong to the truth so that we will be confident when we stand before God. Notice verse 21, that... that even when we feel guilty for our actions, meaning that we haven't lived up to the expectations, we can still have confidence that God loves us and then allows us to come to Him with bold confidence. Now, on the other hand, if we've done it right and we don't feel guilty, the scripture tells us we can still approach God with bold, bold confidence. So let me ask you tonight, is your heart totally free and full of confidence and trust and certainty towards God because you know beyond a shadow of a doubt you are walking in love with others? Meaning all those in, in the body of Christ, your brothers and sisters in the body of Christ? Is your heart Convicted, maybe tonight, and without confidence towards God? Is your heart being convicted that maybe you need to make some adjustments? You know, the Word of God doesn't condemn us, it convicts us. Convictions bring change. And these changes may require you to do something confidentially in your own heart that's just between you and the Lord sometimes it's as easy as just making an adjustment the Bible says in Isaiah 1 verse uh, 1 and verse uh, chapter 1 and verse 19 if you're willing and obedient you shall eat the good of the land sometimes we can be willing sometimes we can we can be obedient there was a, a, a minister many years ago I heard him tell this story how the Lord was telling he came to him one time and he said now 
He was asking the Lord, he says, well, why isn't this happening? Why can't I get victory in this area? Why, 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 why? And the Lord said, because you haven't been willing. Because he kept telling him, I've been obedient. I've been obedient to do exactly what you told me to do. I've been obedient. I'm doing what you tell me to do. I'm obedient. But the Lord said, yes, but you haven't been willing. And he said, the moment that he said that, he realized right on the inside of him, he made an instant course correct. And he said, you're right. I haven't been willing. I, I ask you to forgive me. I apologize. And in just a moment of time, he became willing. It's just that simple. Sometimes it's just a simple course correction in our heart between us and the Lord. On the other hand, maybe you're in a situation where there's been a falling out between yourself and another person. You see, it's not just now between you and the Lord. And because of that, you may need to make a visit, call or write that person to correct that situation. And this isn't going to be easy for you. It's not going to be easy for your flesh. It's not going to be easy for your pride. But it has to be done. Especially if you want to walk in divine health and healing. You're going to have to determine and discern the Lord's body and judge yourself properly by forming a correct opinion about yourself after you have considered all the facts in the light of God's word. Are you doing what the word are, are you coming in line with the precepts and the laws of God's word or are you just kind of adding up partially? When it comes to our love walk, we're all going to fall short of the glory. We are. But we all can examine areas in our life, judge ourselves, investigate our own life where we can make those changes. And if we'll make those changes, oh my goodness, life will be so much easier and better for us. Now, when you take the steps in this area to make these changes, to examine yourself, to judge yourself, to investigate your life, you will have a great liberty. And what's going to happen is you're going to have a sound heart, which will then allow you to be in a wonderful position to lay hold of all God has for you in the area of health and healing. It's important for us. It's important for us to take time to inspect in detail our life and determine the nature or the condition of our love walk. And we do that by investigating thoroughly and testing the waters. We are inspecting ourselves in detail to determine the state and condition of our life more importantly, the state or condition of our love walk, which then allows us to form an opinion of where we are actually at after considering and reviewing all the facts. So we are to investigate ourselves, meaning we are to carry out research and study ourselves so as to discover the facts and information that then would allow us to form an opinion about ourselves, where we are at in our love walk, after we consider all the facts and we review the articles of the Word of God concerning love. Amen? Well, I trust you got something out of this tonight because this is going to conclude this lesson on Back to the Basics on Health and Healing and how important it is to judge and examine our own self. And so uh, next week we're going to pick right back up and we're going to look at how important it is to deal with our past. Woohoo! We all have a past. We all have a future. And God says our future is bright. Now, I never like to close a service without giving you, and especially I know each and every person uh, that is in the house 
is born again, has received that free gift. But maybe you're watching online, part of our online congregation. Maybe you just happened to stop by and you don't know why you stopped by. But I want to tell you something very important this evening. Jesus loves you and he has a great plan for your life and he's waiting for you to accept the promise of the fulfillment of that plan in your life. How, we, how do we do that? Primarily and number one and foremost is we accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. The Bible says this, that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That Greek word saved just means to be made whole. And so without Jesus, it gives implication that we are incomplete. So tonight, I want to invite you to become part of the family of God. I encourage you to take a bold step of faith and receive the promise that Jesus Christ died for you and was risen from the dead so that you could have eternal life with the Father, so that you could step away from your past and into your future, which is bright. How do you do that, Pastor? Well, the Bible says, if we'll confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, we will be saved. Let me pray with you tonight. I encourage you, to, wherever you are at, pray this prayer out loud with me right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and become Lord of my life. I confess with my mouth what I now believe in my heart, that you were raised from the dead. From this moment forward, I'm born again, I'm on my way to heaven, and I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Just that simple, man. Just that simple, and now you're eternally united with the Father, no longer separated from all the benefits of, of the kingdom of heaven. You are now a child of God. Man, I encourage you, uh, if you're watching online, to find a good Bible-believing church in your area. If you're in the San Antonio area, I encourage you to come check us out. His Grace Church, man, we're touching lives and we're changing hearts. We're located in the far west part of San Antonio, Texas. If you want to join us on campus, we have an interactive map, uh, www.hgc.church forward slash locations, showing us exactly kind of where we're located in the city. Um, if you're watching online, I encourage you to check out our digital resources page at www.hcc forward slash or dot church forward slash resources. There's a plethora of material, teaching material to help you develop, help you grow in the things of God. And then if you can find a good church in your area, if you cannot be part of our online congregation right here at His Grace Church, man. I want to encourage you to join us Sunday morning, 10.30 a.m. for our Sunday morning worship celebration. We're going to kick up the jams. We're going to rock the house for Jesus. We're going to get our praise on with our worship team. We're just going to come into the presence of God. We're going to worship Him. And then I'm going to continue teaching on the series. I think, I think uh, it'll be our last session on Dream Killers. And so, hallelujah. God is good. God loves you. God has a great plan for your life. Pastor Kim and I believe that God has something unique to say to you this week, and our hope is that you'll feel His love stronger today than ever before. I'm Pastor Michael Pillmore. This is His Grace Church, a destination for divine visitation where we're touching lives and we're changing hearts. God bless you. See you right back here real soon.